Well, hello, everyone. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Welcome to our webinar on a candid conversation with Bain and Company. Uh, we have two folks from Bain, uh, one who you'll know very well, uh, Keith Bevins, the Global Head of Consultant and Recruiting. He's a Harvard MBA, MIT undergrad, uh, and he's been in charge of global recruiting at Bain for a number of years. And we have with us as well, a senior manager at Bain and Company, a Kellogg MBA, and Keita Baxi. Well, welcome. Hi, good to be here. So, you know, this past year has been <laughs> incredibly unique for all of us, both at work and in our personal lives. I wonder how Bain has adjusted in this uh, year of the pandemic and how business is doing. Two, two very important questions, um, and, and thanks for having us on today. You know, the, the adjustments are, you know, at some level, at a, at a surface level, because of you know, we're working from home, we're remote, I have people on my team that joined Bain remotely, they interviewed remotely, they've never met us in person, and they've been here almost a year. Um, and so there's some adjustments that naturally come with that. I think the things that don't adjust are the culture. You know, I can be as supportive, I can be as caring, I can get to connect with people and get to know people in a way that is consistent with what we were doing pre-pandemic. And so I, I think it's important that people understand there's some core parts of a job that don't change in terms of how you engage, how you interact. The mechanism that you do it has changed. I don't think any of us were using Zoom this much uh, a year ago. Uh, but that part of it is, has been a neat adjustment. And Kita can probably talk to some of what she sees on our client work and our case teams. The business, uh, John, after a very um, uh, harrowing sort of April and May last year has been truly amazing. Uh, the second half of last year, we started to see momentum pick up. Um, and the first quarter of this year has been a record quarter for us. Our business is growing like crazy. We've turned on sort of full open our industry recruiting efforts um, to add capacity to the business. And that's a function of, I've been at Bain 25 years now. This is my third downturn. Uh, they sort of come every decade or so. And, and we have a tested playbook for this. We stand by our clients, we invest in our clients, and we lean into the downturn, not lean out. Uh, a lot of companies like to turtle themselves when things get a little, a little harrowing, whereas we lean in and say, no, this is actually the time we're going to prove that we're truly committed to people's success. And so when things start to pick up, I think people remember that. Um, and, and once again, that playbook is, is proven to be really valuable and really effective. And so as things started to turn around in the economy, our, our business sort of multiplied on top of that. And, and we've been very busy and, and senior managers like Ankita are sort of living that day to day, I think. Yeah, Keith, I would definitely echo that. And I think about that just in cases that I've been working on, um, pivoting to what's most important for our clients. So I've been working on a, on a healthcare client in particular where when, when the shutdown happened, we pivoted all of our work to how do we get you through this? And the beauty is seeing that trajectory of we got them through COVID and that difficult time, and now we're leading them through an integration where they've been able to bounce back and, and continue their growth trajectory. How do you support consultants when you're remote? <laughs> and particularly new hires who, after all, need a lot of mentoring and handholding. Uh, especially for new hires, yeah. whether they're interns or full-time people, I would imagine it's kind of tricky. Yeah, I think um, there's been a, a few things I've seen that have worked that have worked really well. And, and you're right, John, it is a, it is a tricky thing. Um, I think the, what you lose in a virtual setting is that team room environment, right? You're sitting together, you can ask a question, the yeah. mental hurdle of saying, I need to ask a question is higher. And that's where you need to create a little bit of infrastructure around, around of support around your team. So that is, how do we create structural mechanisms to say, where can a brand new consultant go to ask questions in an environment where they don't feel like I have to ask my manager this really tough question. So we've created, like, for example, a Microsoft Teams channel to say, go ask other people in your class and build that connectivity. On my team in particular, we've also done things where we've tried to cross pollinate team members. So individuals of higher tenure mapped with individuals of slightly um, who are newer so that they can ask questions to each other and they're not necessarily working for each other. But it does take a, the, the extra effort, I think, on the leadership teams to think very carefully about how do we bring, how do we coach these teams in that environment? Yeah, yeah. some of it is, is cultural, John, back to your first question, which is, you know, the norms that you set in times like this are really important. 
I, I think people understand that we're all going through the same thing, but it's affecting each of us differently. And so, as I, I keep reminding people, what, two and a half years ago, a kid walked into a BBC interview and went viral. And that's Tuesday now, right? I, I've seen all of my, the kids from my team members, I've seen all of their pets, I've seen all of their spouses. And, and I think the anxiety level that causes some of the stress with working from home were caused by, you know, pre-pandemic, you needed to be perfect when you were on Zoom. You know, everybody in the house be quiet, you know, don't open the door. And it was, in retrospect, probably a little bit more high strung than it needed to be. And I, I think when you have no option because the kids are home, you end up realizing, all right, yeah, my, my toddler is gonna do this one on my lap, right? right. And we're, just, just, you're, we're now gonna have another meeting participant. And, and I think having a culture that sort of says, we gotta meet people where they're at and we should be part of normalizing their lives and de-stressing their lives. We shouldn't be adding stress to their lives of things that are in nobody's control We've always had that kind of culture. And I think the pandemic allowed us to shine in that. And when you talk about onboarding people, you know, we were the only consulting firm that leaned into the summer internship last year. We gave everybody offers, which a lot of people did, but we felt really strongly that people worked hard to get a Bain summer associate offer. And they, they earned that experience. And on four weeks notice, we planned a global training program like we had done every other year. It was all virtual. And you know, some of the things that we liked to do when we were in Cape Cod with them became the Summer Olympics on Tuesday night and the Winter Olympics on Thursday <laughs> night with people in full ski gear in their house, you know, competing in Pictionary and things like that. And we told people, look, if it's not safe, you know, or you have something going on in your personal life where you can't do the summer, let us know. But we want to give you the summer experience. And so we have the experience because we started doing this last year because we felt strongly that people earned it. And so we're onboarding people with a playbook that some companies are going, wow, this isn't gonna end by Easter like somebody said last year. We might actually be doing this for a while and they're now figuring it out. We did that last year. And, and so we're, I think, down the curve and it's, it's not easy, yeah. but Ankita brought up some of the examples that we're doing to sort of translate our culture and create that connectivity. And we know we'll be back in person soon and that's gonna be great, but in the meantime, there's no excuse for us to not support people. Uh, in addition to the tactical things, you know, we have an ergonomic benefit to make people's sort of work situation at home sort of more conducive to doing work. You know, you, you get one living situation when you think, you know, three roommates in a two bedroom apartment because you're all going to be traveling all the time is a good idea. And then work from home comes and it turns out everybody's home. Who's got the kitchen table today, <laughs> right? And so there's some things like that that we're doing to help people. Um, and then it just the mental and emotional health is really important to us. You know, so we've invested in personal capacity training and thinking about you know, stress management and having counselors, emergency child care, all of those types of things, because you know, it's real now. It's not something hypothetical. People are really living something they weren't prepared for. Which to me underlines uh, one important thing about uh, your firm and some of the other world-class professional service firms, you really invest in your people. There's, there's a commitment to personal development that goes above and beyond what you would traditionally find in many uh, organizations. Can you talk well, to that? It, well, our people are our only asset and they go home every day, or in this case, now they stay home, but they decide whether or not they're gonna come back or open up their laptop every morning. And, and at some level, that's a decision that people make every day. And I don't have you know, patents, I don't have a manufacturing facility, I don't have other things that can generate money, I have people. And I need to take care of people. And when you're growing like Bain has grown over the last 27 years, and last year we grew, and this year we're off to record a record year, I, I actually need to keep my people too. I can't just churn through them every two years and just yell next. I actually need the people I hire today to be the leadership team tomorrow. Right. And, and that means I need to do the job in a sustainable way over multiple years, not get them to two years so that I can get all the value out of them and then toss them and replace them. I actually need them to, to start doing the job in a sustainable way. And Keita, how, like, what are some of the things you're doing on your team to sort of make it sustainable? Because that's not easy. Yeah, it's not. I mean, I can talk about some tactical examples, but Keith, even to your point of continuity and long-term staying in this career longer, it's not just a two-year thing. I, I feel like I'm a living example of that, where there has been a lot of support around me. And then there's a pay it forward culture, right? Of saying, it's not just take, take, take. It's people invested in me. I learned by example, and then I'm going to give that back to my teams. Um, but Keith, to, to your question on how do we manage sustainability in particular, on my team, we do a daily standup. 
every day. I talk to my team and I say, what does your evening look like? How can we reprioritize your work? How can we think about, mm -hmm. um, you know, what do you really need to push on tonight? And there, listen, there might be nights where things are late, but we need to make trade-offs and every night can't be like that. And so I think it's really honing in on what what's actually needed, but it's my job to do that prioritization and to think about that for my team. Yeah, and Kitty, you graduated from Kellogg. You've been with Bain for how many years now? This, I'll be five years in October. Okay, so what most surprised you when you joined Bain? Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, as, as a freshly minted MBA, I'm wondering. Honestly, I think you hear a lot in the recruiting process about this topic that we've been talking about, support, right? And I felt very supported in the Bain recruiting process. There were two individuals in particular who I felt really invested in me. And I honestly think the most surprising thing was how that continued when I started. So those exact two individuals reached out to me when I started set up time with me and gave me guidance and we call it PD, but professional development advice. Um, one of them is now a director at Bain and I still am in touch with him. And we meet every kind of quarter to talk about what's my next trajectory. So if I wanna be a partner at Bain, he talks to me about now at the inflection point in my career, what do I need to be thinking about? And I think that it's, it was surprising in the way that it's like, well, of course in recruiting, you're gonna put your arms around me, but the fact that you've invested and you believe in that investment, even when I start, made a huge difference. That's, that's great. Uh, Keith, how do you, how, I think there are a lot of people who wonder this, so I wanna just get it out there. Um, how does Bain differ from, you know, those other two firms in that famous acronym that you like to reverse, you know, the BBM? <laughs> that's not reverse. That's actually the way it should be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in, 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 different in, in, in what sense? Uh, like, cause there's a couple of different things that come to mind. Um, uh, maybe, maybe culture, maybe a work life, um, yeah. what you can expect. Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple, look, I've, I've worked here for 25 years. I haven't worked at any of those other places, okay? What I would say is that there are some things that stand out to me about Bain, and some of it's what Ankita just talked about, which is when you join Bain, you join a community, you join an office, and it's not to say that you're sort of only working in a local market, but it is saying that your team will come from that office, and so you'll build those relationships. You know, my first manager at Bain, is our chief diversity officer. She's still here 25 years later. She wrote all of my reviews for 17 years from when I started as an AC to when I got promoted to partner. In <laughs> fact, the first partner on that case, we share an executive assistant together 25 years later. Wow. Right, and so you, and, and the mentor that I met when I was 19 in college is still a mentor. She lives two blocks over and she's still a bank. And, and so I joined a community of people that as Ankito said, you know, like they're not just there to get me into the firm, they're part of my crew while I'm here. And I think that's different. I think that's unique because when you're sort of a citizen of the firm and you're staffed on this project one time and then you're starting over fresh with a bunch of strangers on your next project, you don't build those same relationships. And it's not better or worse, it's just different. I don't, I'm not, I'm not the life of the party that has thousands of friends. I have a few very close friends and Bain has allowed me to sort of live that type of way, but it's consistent with who I am as a person. I do think that, you know, our approaches to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how we think about having an impact off of the events of 2020 are also a good example of the differences in the firms. You know, there is a place for studying the problem. There is a place for measuring the problem. And, and Bain invested in 110 and building a coalition of companies to get 1 million Black Americans jobs and, and you know, sustainable, well-paying jobs. That, that yeah. juxtaposition of the three approaches that the firms are taking is a good indication of the difference in the firms. All three are doing important things. Our approach was to build a team of companies to solve the problem together and actually make an impact. I need to study it. I need to measure it. But at the end of the day, people either have jobs and money or they don't. And that's what we're focused on. And so when we talk about we're about results, we talk about we're about having an impact. There are places and there is a place for academic studying and measuring. And we do that work. But what gets us excited is actually like having an impact. Like, you know, like Ankita said, staying by our clients to get through that. Like, I know one of our clients in Chicago pivoted to they needed to account for their entire workforce. It was like pencils down on strategy. Let's make sure everyone is safe back in March. Like, that's real. Strategy is necessary, but like the real thing right now is, are people safe? Right. And when you think about our approach to DEI and 
compare the three firms, it's all important, but we're all approaching it different ways. And people should think about which way is going to get them excited. And it's not better or worse, it's just different. So um, among these latest commitments to diversity and inclusion, uh, you mentioned one which is really stellar. Uh, yeah. What other kinds of things are you doing? It's a good question. So we, we put out the, um, the seven points back in June. A lot of companies posted a black square and, and put out their pledges and whatever. Um, I think the investments we're making behind those pledges are what matters, right? When, when the fad of the black square is done, what have you actually accomplished? Um, you know, we have named some very senior leaders to lead the effort. So Maria Gordian uh, is leading Bain's DEI council. Uh, Maria is also a board member of Bain as part of that role. You know, Julie Kaufman is leading our internal transformation as our chief diversity officer, the first one that we've ever had. Um, and Julie has been passionate about that for a long time. She stood up our Global Women's Leadership Council over a decade ago. Um, and so this is just a continuation of Julie's leadership on diversity, both inside and outside of Bain. Um, one of those seven point pledges also has a new leader named John Barfield, uh, who is a partner in our New York office um, and a black man. He is leading the $100 million pledge over five years to invest in racial equity and social justice uh, through our pro bono efforts. And that racial equity social justice pillar is now John's responsibility as well. Um, and then more broadly, we're doing bigger outreach. You know, We have more diversity programs. I was on a call this morning for a diversity program that it's just us three on this call um, that we will be uh, announcing at one of our business schools um, in a couple of months. Um, to, to increase the diversity pipeline. And it's not just about hiring, it's about getting exposure in those communities. You know, growing up with my family, we weren't debating private equity versus consulting versus banking at the dinner table. That was not a thing. And so we're doing some of those early pipeline development programs as well. I, I'll, I'll, I'll add one last thing, which is we closed down the firm last year in, North, in the Americas for Juneteenth. Uh, and it was a day of learning, reflection, and discussion. And we, we had a very good meeting with all of us in the morning and then gave people the afternoon to do small group discussions, do their research, watch 13th, like just learn. We decided to do that again this year, specifically to get at what you're, I think is underlying your question, which is, okay, it's been a year, what have we accomplished? Mm -hmm. and, and we're doing that again. I wouldn't be surprised if it turns out to be a company holiday or a, a day of reflect, like an annual thing, but we're gonna go back and say, what did we accomplish for the year? It's enough, you know, it's it, you, to say you're going to do something is one thing to actually do something is a different thing. And we're going to hold ourselves accountable and and read out to all of the employees in the Americas to see what we've done. I think they're going to like the answer. And I think we have a lot of work to do. We're a long way from the starting line, but we're also a long way from the finish line. So what are you really looking for when you look at people talent? And, well, and you know, I know that there are these big, big terms about leadership ability and uh, you know, one's analytical prowess to to look at a complex problem and, and tear it apart. What, what are you really looking for? What's the magic? That's the truth. And you know, you, you, I mean, you're managing these people on the teams. You know, it, at a high level, it is it is those things, and those are evergreen. I don't think we're unique in looking for it. The humility that we look for is different, for sure. You know, I I know from you know having Ankita, had Ankita's role. Yeah, you know, like having a team that can actually like listen to people mm. and, and empathize with people and put themselves in their shoes, that's actually really important. And that's not a case interview thing. Like that's, right. you, you have to test for that. Yeah, Keith, the other thing I would add with that, and I think it goes with humility, is just natural curiosity. We're solving really interesting problems. And I think when the focus becomes too much on, I have to fix this thing, or I need to work on, I need to build up this strength, you lose that sense of, I'm just curious about the problem. And this is how I coach people when I'm going through the recruiting process, but also my team, right? Is let's just be open and think about how do we come at this at different ways and enjoy the process instead of worrying about kind of all that other stuff around us. Yeah, true. Now, Monday, you have a, a launch date for Experience Bain, which is your pre-MBA summer experience. Yep. Uh, tell us a little about it and tell us how it may differ because I understand that there is, while there's an application, you're not really applying and will get rejected. Everyone's gonna have some taste of Bain. Yeah, it's a good question. You know, So Experience Bain is one of the things that we do for pre-MBA students who want to learn about consulting. And, and I, in my previous answer, I was referring to sort of diverse population, black and Latinx folks not knowing a lot about consulting or Bain, but that's true of a lot of people. 
Um, and one of the things that we like to do is help people prepare for how they're going to invest their time in school by giving them a taste to see what they're interested in. I would say a material number of the people who participate in Experience Bingo, that was amazing. And I want no part of consulting. I'm like, great. <laughs> you'll save you time. You'll save us time. It's it's you know, win win. Um, and so what we do in Experience Bain is we give people a chance to, uh, who, who have never heard of consulting or Bain, we give them opportunities to just hear what we do and see examples of casework and just learn about the industries that we're participating in and the work that we're doing. For people who are a little further along in the journey, maybe recruited with us pre-business school or out of undergrad or even worked in consulting, we give them a chance to really get to know us and how our model is different because it, to my earlier point, like the nuances are where the difference is made. You know, you're, you'd probably be choosing between really great options. The question is, which one is a great option for you? Right. Um, and so our goal is to make sure that people have a chance to get to see our work, meet our people. Um, you know, last fall for campus recruiting, for example, we did a panel on, so you want to be a Bain partner. And it was actually S-O, capital O. And it was actually Bain spouses doing a panel discussion for people in business schools, spouses, <laughs> about what it's like to be a partner of someone at Bain. Right. Because because that's ultimately like we know you're a whole person. You have a life outside of Bain and Bain has to fit into your life. And for me personally, you know, my wife is as big a factor as why I stay and choose to stay as anybody. Because if it doesn't work for us, then it doesn't work for me. Right. Right. And so so we're doing some of that stuff with Experience Bain. Um, some of the events, because of the nature of what I described, um, of wanting people to get to know us in a more intimate setting are going to be capacity constrained but a lot of them won't be, and it'll be a great chance for people to get to know us. And we do a lot of campus programming. Kita led one of the efforts at one of our, our, our schools this past year. Um, and so, you know, it dovetails very nicely. It you know, gives people a running start into the campus cycle. Now, Keith, suppose I'm a diamond in the rough, but I really want to work for Bain. Yeah. Should I expose myself to you guys in a pre-MBA experience program, or should I hold off and wait and get you know, get the sand uh, rubbed, rubbed, yeah, yeah, rubbed, yeah. rubbed down and sand it off uh, through one year of my MBA program before I let you see myself. That is the million dollar question. And the answer is you should get to know us, you get to know us early. We know where you are in the journey. You yeah. know, we know, we, we've seen people, look, in the Chicago office during my tenure, it wasn't recent, but we've had somebody who was a professional drummer before business school. We had somebody who was a chef before business school. We had somebody who was an opera singer before business school. Ironically, two of them went to the same business school. Uh, but I say that to say that we're looking for the talent. We, we are confident in the apprenticeship that Ankita talked about that you can learn the job. I'm looking for good athletes. I can teach them how to play the sport. And so the yeah. sooner you can be on our radar and the sooner you can start understanding the sport you're trying to play, the better. You don't, you shouldn't wait. That's the purpose of experience Bain. Otherwise we would just wait until January and just interview people who figured it out. And we want to be a part of the journey. We want you to experience the support we provide when you decide you're interested in learning about us. So absolutely don't wait. And Keita, how is it, what was it like for you coming through the process? Cause you've done it more recently than me. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is I think we actually put, put the support around people to dust some of that sand off. Like you were saying, John, where it's, we know exactly what Keith was saying. We know where you are, but you're going to have the right touch points with people before your interview so that you're ready for your interview. And that was the experience for me. I um, I still remember her name, but she's a consultant who who reached out to me when I was, um, I, I did the one-year program at Kellogg, but who reached out to me when I was just starting. And she said, why don't we do a practice case together? And this was after an answer first workshop that we had done. And it was low stakes, right? But she gave me some coaching and she said, listen, you should push here and, and make sure that you work on your framing. And that helped me go and prep later. But I got some of that early feedback. And that's where I think it's really important to get to know us early because we can start to engage and coach you so that you are set up for success going into your interview. You know, John, it, it's funny. As Ankita said that, it reminded me. One of the things that we talk about is that we like to work in teams. It's, it's part of your cliches of things that consulting firms say to get students excited. But the truth is, we will come up with a better answer if we operate our case teams like a jazz quartet. I play a little bit, I flip it to Ankita, she plays a little bit, flips it to the drummer, right? And that dynamic is what Ankita just described. And what, what ends up happening is people who have that mindset of, well, until it's ready, I'm gonna keep it to myself and then I'll, I'll unveil it when recruiting season like starts on campus. That mindset actually is the reason a lot of people struggle when they get here. 
Yeah. Because they think they're going to solve the answer on their own and bring it to the case team meeting perfect. And I'm like, that's not, if, if it were that easy that you six months out of school could figure it out, we wouldn't have a business model. The truth is I need some of your thinking and I need you comfortable bringing something that's not fully baked to the potluck so that we could season it up and cook the rest of it together. Right. And I see that in recruiting and that's actually a bigger red flag than maybe some of the performance issues they might expose in June. Because right. the truth is when you get here, you have to be comfortable sharing things that aren't where your A plus type A self wants it. It's gonna be work in process, but you have to trust your team and be a part of the team. So Ankita, I don't know if you're Coltrane or Miles in this uh, jazz quartet, but uh, <laughs> Talk a little bit about the career path of an MBA who joins uh, Bain uh, and, and maybe even relate it to your own. Yeah, sure. I'll, I want to talk about it in the, in the kind of first three years of your career, because I think that's most relevant when you're coming yeah. right out of business school. So your first year as a, as a consultant, you're a, we, we say C1, your first year consultant. A lot of that is learning how to do the job, right? Especially if you've never done consulting before. So you're learning, you're building analytical skills. You are learning how to talk to clients. You are learning exactly what Keith was saying was, how do I get the right input from the team and learn how, what does ownership mean where I drive the process forward and then um, get input from others as needed. And so I would say as an, as an, in my at least in my first six months, I played more of an individual contributor role. And that was Bain setting me up for success, not expecting me to also learn how to, you know, manage a whole team while also learning how to do consulting. Um, that's a progression, right? And the whole point is to build on your skills. So once you've mastered some of those skills, you start learning, well, how do I how do I manage a team? How do I manage a more complex client relationship? That is how your trajectory kind of moves. And then in your third year as a you actually become a manager and that's where you're managing a team. You're learning how to take on multiple direct reports, how to manage client relationships, how to work with your partners and actually pull them in when you need them. Um, and then you hit the promotion point. So you go from manager to senior manager, at which point you are kind of fully up and running, right? You've mastered all of those skills below you and you're at the consultant level. And then you're starting to work on um, let me just get really good reps in. Let me get really good at cracking a problem. Let me get really good at running the full team. Let me build lasting client relationships that will hopefully carry you through associate partner and then partner. And I'm assuming that when one gets hired, you're effectively a generalist or are you assigned to a practice where you may have an interest like healthcare, sustainability, whatever? Yeah, we, I would say we have a unique model there. So we do, we have a generalist model at Bain and I very much followed that. I said, put me in wherever, wherever you want. Cause I want to learn a little bit of everything. However, the model also allows for you to state preferences. And that does not mean you have to go and network with the right partners and, and kind of figure out where your home is. We have a dedicated kind of staffing manager who has been a frontline manager, just like me, who would rotates in and understands the needs of the business, but also understands the needs of you as a person. And so you get to tell them, hey, I'm really interested in healthcare, or I'm really interested in sustainability. So if a case like this is available, please put me on there. So I think the beauty of it is we have a generalist model, but you have a voice in that that allows you to kind of build your own vein is kind of what we call it. Yeah, and build we- your own vein, I like that. Yeah, we, we actually do bring some people in, uh, John, as you're familiar with. We have some expert tracks that people start specialized right away. Um, and so we have, like for our performance improvement practice, we hire first year MBAs and new consultants directly into that practice. And what that means is that they're going to focus on supply chain or procurement or you know, enterprise tech. And, and we have a few of those roles as well. So some people come in very clearly set on that as what they want to do. It's largely based on their prior experience or what they studied in school. And those are great too. But generally speaking, we want people to have that general manager skill set so they can prepare prepare to run a business in the future, right? You're going to see strategy. You're going to see operations. You're going to see sales. You're going to see customer because you can't have a CEO sort of talk to the board. And when she says, uh, yeah, our business is struggling, uh, but it looks like it's our operations. I don't really do operations. Like that's not a, that's not a thing, right? And we're training people to be general managers. And so I want people to have that foundation early in their career. And then by the time they get to Ankita's level, they start to specialize and start to affiliate more and get those reps in an area of interest. But on the front end, I need them to see it all because I'm preparing them for down the line, not 
you know, what they're, what they're interested in like right now for this moment in time. So Keith, uh, early in the conversation, you said Bain is now experiencing uh, what will be a record year in growth. Yeah. Uh, does that indicate that there will be a record recruitment year as well for MBAs? I am proud to say that every year I have been in my role, we're going into year eight. Uh, and I think I've told you this before, it's still true. Uh, I know you keep saying like, no, seriously, but yeah, seriously. Um, you know, last year we had our largest summer class ever. I expect to have our largest summer class again. Um, frankly, we did summer associate recruiting and we had a goal. I, I tell students all the time, we don't have a target for our summer associate program. Our summer associate program is as big as we can make it. And this year we had a sort of a, a minimum that we wanted and we blew by that by several dozen uh, in North America. Uh, so we're really excited about that. So yes, we, Bain will be open for business as far as hiring goes uh, on campus in the fall. Um, and if you're a working professional and listening in and are interested in joining us, um, go to the website and apply. We actually have been hiring people um, sort of nonstop for the last couple of months. We have a start date coming up, I think next week. Uh, and a couple in May as well of people who are joining the firm right now, sort of off the campus cycle. Um, but we're really excited about the prospects for the business and that the playbook once again seems to have worked quite well. So Keith, uh, since you're hiring yeah. working professionals, do you think I can apply? You know, John, I, I think so. Uh, I'll have to, we'll have to see how your framing and your case math is. The, uh, but no, we, we do actually, that's one of the things that most people don't always think about with Bain. They think about the on-ramps for us and a lot of professional services firms as the campus recruiting cycle. And they don't realize that as a you know, five plus billion dollar firm with 60 offices around the world, we actually have corporate functions. I was on the phone with our procurement team this morning. You know, we have a, a big, a whole finance organization. And so I think people sort of think of Bain and say, well, I don't want to be a consultant. And I'm like, we have other roles. You know, we have a, a world-class IT department because of the work that we do with M&A and private equity. You know, we have some of the best sort of cybersecurity teams out there. Like we have all of those types of opportunities and people just tend to think, well, I don't know that I want to be a generalist consultant. And Keita said, I'd have to be a generalist. It's like, well, no, there's actually a lot of opportunities for people who are interested in design thinking, who are interested in, you know, digital prototyping and, and enterprise solutions and things like that. So. Maybe we can find a place for you, John. I'll have to get back to you. <laughs> All right. Well, Ankita and Keith, thank you so much for your time. I know how valuable it is, and I really appreciate it. And for all of you out there, I uh, want to learn more about Bain. Come to our pre-MBA networking festival. Bain is a key participant and sponsor. Uh, we're really grateful uh, for their support and encouragement. Uh, and as you can see from this conversation, they're energized, they're passionate, they really believe they're in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. So thanks for joining us. Awesome, and thank Keith, you. A pleasure, and Ankita, good luck to you for the rest of your career. I wanna see you a be a partner in a couple <laughs> more years only. Seven years is enough. You need to be a partner at, at year seven. The pressure's uh, on. Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> and this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Thanks for watching. Thanks everyone.